I believe we can start. Fantastic. A very warm welcome to everyone. <laughs> and thank you for taking part to this session uh, on Zoom and uh, on, uh, on YouTube. And uh, I'm very glad to introduce the third uh, session of the seminar cycle Beyond the Visual. It's a tri trilingual si uh, seminar that's uh, in, uh, in English, French, and Italian. So the French title is Au-delà du visuel. Uh, but uh, so this time, as you probably already noticed, we are going to speak uh, English. So um, it is just a few words on the on the on the seminar cycle. This is the third year and uh, the third, um, so to say, edition of a, a wider project named Anthropology of Digital Images that we are that we have been conducting um, at the Collège de Bernardin precisely. Um, it is organized by the Department Digital Humanism with uh, the collaboration of the University of, uh, of Turing. Now, before starting, uh, I'd like to uh, make a few, <laughs> to thank a few people that uh, without uh, which this would not have been possible. Of course, I'd like to thank Gemma Serrano and uh, Graziano Lingua, who are the co-directors of the department and who are in charge of uh, organizing the <laughs> scientific and, uh, uh, so to say, uh, um, they also take charge of the, administ or the administrational work that is necessary in order to do all this. We are, um, I also like to thank the IF Foundation that uh, supports our project uh, and in general the research we are conducting at the department. And finally, I'd like to thank um, the members of the research group that uh, are working on this project, namely, first of all, Antonio Lucci, that is my partner in crime in the organization of this specific edition of uh, uh, the seminar of Beyond the, the Visual, but also Jacopo Bodini, Morgan Blen, uh, Stanislas de Fourville, uh, who are also um, actively participating in the organization and in the research that is behind this, uh, this, such, this session. So uh, um, a few words on the structure of the evening. Um, there are two, uh, as I already said, this uh, is happening on two different platforms, namely on Zoom and on YouTube. Uh, who, um, those of you who um, have joined us on Zoom will have the occasion to directly speak with uh, our um, presenter of today, with our guest of today. Those who are on YouTube are unfortunately have about 20, 30 seconds of delay, but uh, they will be able to follow us, of course, and they are very welcome to uh, ask questions in the chat. Uh, Morgan will be very happy to communicate them to us and to um, let you participate in the debate. So um, the guest of today, uh, I am incredibly happy to have it with us, is uh, Professor Thomas Marco, and Antonio will present him in a, in a, few, in a few seconds. Um, but uh, before saying that, uh, just a few, uh, just a last word. At the end of the session, when you quit Zoom, basically, uh, you will receive a message that asks you to evaluate the event and to answer a few questions about how your impression, of, about your impression of the event in general. We need this in order to uh, have a feedback of the events we organize. So you are warmly um, invited to, to take part to the um, to the to the questionnaire and to answer the questions if you if you may. So thank you. Again, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for participating in this seminar, but most of all, of course, Professor Marco for having accepted this invitation. I am, uh, uh, as as one says in German, very gespannt to hear in uh, his uh, his paper, and I leave the word to my colleague Antonio Lucci for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, I'm really proud to be your partner in crime in this adventure. Uh, dear Thomas, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to today's meeting of our seminar of the audiovisual. Today, I have the honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Dr. Thomas Mahu, one of the most eminent cultural scientists of the German-speaking area. 
Thomas Marco is the since 2016 director of the International Research Center for Cultural Studies, IFK Vienna. He has previously held many academics and, and institutional positions. He was from 1993 until 2016, professor of cultural history at Humboldt University in Berlin. From 2006 until 2008, he was dean of the philosophy faculty tree. And from 2009 until 2011, was director of the Institute for Cultural Science at the Humboldt University. Thomas Marco has also held numerous international fellowships, including one at the International College for Cultural Technology Research and Media Philosophy at the Bauhaus University Weimar, and the International College Morphomat at Cologne University. Among his numerous publications, I would like to mention here his latest monograph on the topic of suicide, Das Leben nehmen, Suicide in der Moderne, 2017, which also won the prestigious Sigmund Freud Prize and has already been translated into numerous foreign languages, including Spanish and Italian. His important book about cultural models, For Builder, published in 2011, and this foundational work about thanatology, Todas Metaphern, published 1987. Thomas, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to participate. The virtual floor is yours. Dear and dear Antonio Lucci, dear Alessandro de Cesare, dear friends, dear students, dear guests. Before I begin my short address, I would like to thank you very much for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to create, while speaking, a kind of triangle between Torino, Paris, Lyon and Berlin. Beyond the visual, the guiding title of the seminar can be discussed in more than one way. On the one hand, it can be related to artifacts and media. We could, for instance, discuss the status of images, drawings, paintings, statues, or buildings. We could talk about the difference between the image as a surface and a three-dimensional shape. We could refer to the methods of representation since the implement implementation of the central perspective. But we also think about the influence of various media on the production and design of the visual, which range from the use of colors, image carriers, and tools, such as brushes or crayons, to mirrors, Lorraine glasses, cameras, or smartphones. On the other hand, it would also be possible to focus on seeing itself and on its epistemology. We could then go on to examine the vision of various animal species from the compound eyes of insects to the lateral eye positions of birds, cattle, and horses, and compare it to the vision of humans. In the talk that follows, I will discuss human vision in the sense of seeing in the not seeing, by which I mean the seeing of the blind. I will proceed by outlining three possible approaches to this broad and complex topic. I will first talk about blind seers, then second about seeing time, that is looking into the future, something like the second sight. And finally, third about hands, colors, dreams, and revelations. Originally, I had planned to accompany my talk with a PowerPoint presentation, but then this intention seemed increasingly absurd. Why, I asked myself, should we explore the beyond of the visual with the help of illustrations? So my hope is now that while I speak and while you listen, I will manage to conjure up inner images in our consciousness, inner images which can perhaps also take us away from the too familiar Zoom desert of black tiles and empty spotlights. Living in quarantine and isolation has become for us, and we shudder slightly with horror at the thought of it, like living in the city of the blind, which Jose Salamago famously describes in his novel from 1995. Here, as you will remember, he shows blindness as an effect of a pandemic. But now I'll start with the first chapter on blind seers. The motif of the blind seers has been known for at least as far back as antiquity. Although the term itself seems to express a paradox, we can either see or we are blind. Let us recall the story of the Tebani seer Teresias, which has been retold many times through history. He was the son of a shepherd and a nymph named Carico, 
the ancient tradition linked the paradox of the blind seer with the no less paradoxical life of Theresias as both a man and a woman. He had chanced upon a pair of copulating snakes in the mountains, killed the female snake and was then transformed into a woman. Seven years later, he again happened on such a pair of snakes, but now he killed the male snake and instantly became a man again. When Zeiss and Hera discuss whether women or men experience greater pleasure <coughs> during the sexual act, they consult Theresias, who gives a clear answer. Women feel 10 times more pleasure than men. He confirms Zeiss' opinion, which enrages Hera, and to punish him, she has Theresias blinded. Zeiss, however, bestows in on, on him the gift of prophecy. This, at least, is the version given by Ovid in his Metamorphosis or by Lucian in the Conversations with the Dead. Referring to Kalimachos of Kyrene, who lived several centuries before Ovid and Lucian, Nicole Loro, in her study on the experiences of Theresias, quotes another version of the story. According to this version, Theresias surprised the goddess Athena and his mother while they were bathing in a spring. Quote, Accompanied by the nymph Calico, the divine virgin has untied her peplops and is bathing in the water of a spring, the midday silence all around her. The adolescent hunter and son of the nymph, Theresias, approaches led by an unquenchable thirst to the spring, and the unfortunate one, without wishing it, saw what is forbidden to be seen, full of rage, Athena cries out, and night is already overtaking the child's eyes. Unquote. Athena then reminded the blind man of the law of Kronos, to which she herself was subject just as much as the son of the nymph. It said that no one was allowed to look at the goddesses and gods. We know such prohibitions of looking from other religions too. Deities must remain invisible. They cannot be looked at without forfeiting their own prestige, unseen in German without seriously injuring the, the opponent of the case. When Moses asked on Mount Sinai, now show me your glory, Yahweh answered him, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. But the God proposed a compromise. There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. So in the book of Exodus. Only Jacob, who was struggling with God for life and blessing, was allowed to look into his face for a moment. After that, he gave the name Penuel, God's face, to the place of battle and said, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Even Saul is blind for three days after the flash of light near Damascus. In his notes from Hampstead, Elias Canetti quotes in 1971 the following detail about an ancient Colombian high culture, the Muisca. The Muisca believed an ordinary man could not bear to look upon the prince with impunity. For this reason, it was the custom to sentence criminals to gaze now and then at the prince." Unquote. But why are the immortals, or even princes and kings, not allowed to be looked at? Why is the exchange of glances with them life-threatening? Why do goddesses and gods have to transform themselves into animals if they want to meet humans? On one occasion only is Zeiss persuaded to show himself to his beloved, not in the form of an animal or a mortal, for example, as in Phytrion, in the seduction of Agnine, but in his terrific splendor. Promptly, you know, Senele falls to the ground as if struck by lightning, and the palace of Cadmos goes up in flames. Nicole Loro refers to the terrifying childhood anxiety about losing one's sights that Freud detected in the Sandman by Hoffman. She recalls with reference to Freud the uncanny in German unheimlich character even of a patron goddess like Pallas Athena. For Homer, 
quote, Athena is filly, beloved, laughing, and knows how to cultivate the bonds of familiarity that unite her with those under her protection. But the poet is never mistaken. It is a terrible divinity. They in a Teos who climbs on Diomedes' chariot or who aids Heracles in his laboratories. File, Deine, there in the tension between these two qualifiers lies the familiar strangeness in the form of a goddess. Unquote Loro. The comparison with the similar story of Artemis and Actaeon is rewarding. Here, too, a hunter surprises the goddess while she is bathing in the circle of her nymphs. However, Actaeon is not struck with blindness as a punishment. He is transformed into a stag and then torn apart by his own, own dogs. He loses not the eyes, he loses the voice. Actaeon does call his dogs. Ovid lists 35 proper names of the dogs. It's a long list. Hyginus even 81. But the dogs hear only the roaring of a stag rather than the voice of their master. Roberto Calasso, in his extensive 2016 book on the celestial hunter, has described the metamorphosis between hunter and hunted animals similar to Elias Canetti in Crowds and Power from 1960. Calasso characterizes the hunt as the essential operation of transformation by Xilas. It generates guilt and consequently transformations into the victim. The hunter and the huntress, Calasso devotes extensive commands to the goddess Artemis, transforming to the captured animals. And then, what was killing? Carasso asked already on the first pages of his book, and immediately he gives the answer. If the man became the bear when he was killing it, he was attacking himself. Somehow kind of suicide. And he reminds us of the dark relationship between hunting, killing, and eating. Quote Carasso, those who eat are making something disappear. This is even more mysterious than killing. Where does it go when it disappears? It goes into the invisible, which eventually teems with presences. There is nothing more alive than absence. What then is to be done about all those beings? Perhaps they need to be helped on their way to absence, to be accompanied for part of their journey. Killing was like saying goodbye. And like every goodbye, it required certain gestures, certain words, they began to celebrate sacrifices. <coughs> Unquote Colasso. Why do deities like to dress up as animals? Why do we know so many sacred animals from different eras and cultures? Why are even the Christian saints often depicted with animals, Leonhard with horses, Anthony with donkeys or pigs, Martin with geese, Gallus with a bear? Why are souls or even the Holy Spirit associated with birds? Why do even the signs of the zodiac mostly refer to animals, Aries, Taurus, Cancer, Leo, Scorpio, Capricorn, Pistis? There is one obvious answer, which Barbara Ehrenreich exemplified in detail in her study of the blood rites from 1997. This answer says simply that the first gods, and Carasso is following Ehrenreich, were predators admired by prehistoric men who often had to wait long enough until they were allowed to eat the remains of the prey, maybe in competition with hyenas. The prehistoric men were not yet hunters or huntresses, they were simple scavengers. So while they waited, they naturally had to avoid at all costs to be seen by the godlike animals. This law is still valid today, as the French anthropologist and writer Anastasia Martin, a student of Philippe Descola, forcefully testifies. As an expert on indigenous ethnic groups in the Arctic, she first conducted field research with the Guichin in Alaska and later with the Edens in Kamchatka. There, on a mountain tour, she survived a fight with a bear that tore off half her face before retreating. She was forced to return to France as soon as possible after the incident. Numerous jaw and facial reconstruction surgeries followed. At some point, the anthropologist decides to travel back to Kamchatka in order to be able to process the frightening, this frightening experience appropriately. 
Among the events, she is now considered a Mietka, a person who has survived the bear's attack and been marked by it. She is henceforth considered half human, half bear, rejected and respected at the same time. At one point, she has a long conversation with the 70 years old Vasya. I quote, bears are the most intelligent of all animals, he tells me. They are like humans, just as powerful. Did you know that? I knew it. And do you know why he bit you on the face? He asks. Oh, I don't know. He points his finger at my eyes. Because of them, he says, he laughs. He furrows his brows and continues talking. Bears can bear to look into people's eyes because they see in them the reflection of their own souls. Do you understand? No, not really, I answer. But it's simple, Nastya. A bear that meets a human's gaze will always try to erase what it sees in it. That's why he will inevitably attack when he sees your eyes. You looked into his eyes, didn't you? Yes. Ah, he exclaims, I knew it. What makes bears different from us is that they can't look each other in the face. Do you understand now? Yes, I understand. Luckily, they don't have mirrors, otherwise they would all go crazy. Vasya laughs, silverly brightly, and I with him." Unquote. In the paragraph immediately following, Nastasia Martin quotes a passage from Jean-Pierre Bernard's Death in the Eyes from 1985. Bernard is writing, this is the context in which to examine the frontality of Gogo, the monstrousness, of which he, we speak is characterized by the fact that it can only be approached frontally in a direct confrontation with the power that demands that in order to see it, one enter into the field of its fascination and risk losing oneself in it. To see the Gorgon is to look her in the eyes and in the exchange of cases to cease to be oneself, a living being and to become like her a power of death. To star at Gorgon is to lose one's sight in her eyes and to be transformed into stone, an unseeing, opaque object. From the beer in Kamchatka to the serpent head of Gorgon, Nastasia Martin's leap into antiquity takes us back to Theresias. Nicole Leroux also lets the copulating snakes whom Theresias encounters remind her not only of the mystery of bisexuality, linked to the appearance of the naked Athena, the muscular and warlike virgin, but also of the Gorgon. Athena hated reflecting water surfaces. One day playing the flute which she had just invented, she beheld her image on the water and saw her face disfigured like the Gorgon. The flute mutates into a snake, the tension of the face into an expression of terror, which seems to seize the Gorgon in numerous depictions as if in anticipation of her own mirror image. I'm now trying to come to chapter two, looking into the future. Theresias is compensated for his blindness, not only by the experience of Beecher's sexuality, which he perhaps shares, according to Nicole Loro, with the divine Athena, but also by the gift of divination, of looking into the future. But this case, we are told in the fifth hymn of Kalimachos, is actually a capacity of hearing. Athena gives Theresias the ability to understand the singing of the birds and, as it were, to practice the duties of augury as a blind interpreter. I quote from the hymn of Kalimachos the passage in which the nymph Cariko, the mother of the young Theresias, laments and criticizes the punishment of the goddess, but is then comforted by her. Quote, and the goddess Athena pitied her comrade and spake to her and said, Noble lady, take back all the words that thou hast spoken in anger. It is not that I made that child blind, for no sweet finger is it for Athena to snatch away the eyes of children. But the laws of Cronus order thus, whosoever shall behold any of the immortals, when the god himself chooses not, at a heavy price shall be behold. Noble lady, the thing that is done can no more be taken back. Athena then reminds Carico of the fate of the hunter Actaeon, whose mother would have made many sacrifices to at least be allowed to embrace her dead son, mauled by his own dogs. Therefore, quoting uh, 
Kadimachus, O comrade, lament not for to this thy son, for thy sake shall remain many other honors from me, for I will make him a seer to be sung of me hereafter, yeah, more excellent than any other. He shall know the birds, which is of good omen among all the countless birds that fly and what birds are of ill omen fly. Many oracles shall he utter to the Boeotians and many unto Cadmus and to the mighty sons of Latacus in later days. Unquote. But how is the gift of divination as seeing in time, as it were, related to the ability to hear in the sense of an inner seeing? John Martin Hull, professor of religious education at the University of Birmingham, went completely blind at the age of 48. Several years later, he wrote a magnificent book about his experience of blindness, which is, has been published in numerous editions and translations since 1990, with a foreword by Oliver Sacks. In this book, more than 2,000 years after Kalimachos, Hal tells us that the world of the blind is a world of time. I quote, sighted people can bend time. For sighted people, time is sometimes slow and sometimes rapid. They can make up for being lazy by rushing later on. Things can be gathered up quickly in a few minutes. It is a bit like the change in your sense of time when you buy a car. Journeys that previously took two hours now take 20 minutes. You are amazed at how much you more you can squeeze in. In this way, you force time to your will. Time for sighted people is that against which they fight for me. As a blind person, time is simply the medium of my activities. Time against which you previously fought becomes simply the stream of consciousness within which you act. This world of time is at the same time an acoustic space of appearance and disappearance of sound and noises. Quoting again, the strange thing about it, however, is that it was a world of nothing but action. Every sound was a point of activity. Where nothing was happening, there was silence. That little part of the world then died, disappeared. The ducks were silent. Had they gone or was something holding their rapt attention? The boat came to rest. Were people leaning on their oars or had they tied it to the edge and gone away? Nobody was walking past me just now. This meant that the footpath itself had disappeared. I could only remind myself of its direction by considering that it ran parallel to the bench upon which I sat. Even the traffic on the main road had passed. Where the lights red, when there is rest, everything else passes out of existence. To rest is not to be. To do is to be. Mine is not a world of being. It is a world of becoming. The world of being, the silent, still world where things simply are, that doesn't exist. The rockery, the pavilion on the skyline of high-rise flats, the flagpoles over the cricket ground, none of this is really there. The world of happenings, of movement and conflict, that is there. The acoustic world is one in which things pass in and out of existence. This happens with such surprising rapidity. There seems to be no intermediate zone of approach. Acoustic space is a world of revelation. Quote that. A world of becoming. Jose Luis Borges says in his famous lecture on blindness from August the 3rd, 1977, since I have lost the beloved world of appearances, I must create something else. I must create the future which succeeds the vision, the visible world I have in fact lost. Those who live in such kind of future, a world of revelation, a world of becoming, gradually lose their sense of need. Images and visual perceptions of a meal, Hal explains, stimulate appetite and hunger. The blind, on the other hand, involuntarily converts to asceticism. As always, however, sight is the foundation upon which the other sense is built. Blindness dislocates this primordial union of desire and image. I'm often bored by food, feel that I'm losing interest in it or cannot be bothered eating. Food has already disappeared before it can made to disappear as Robert Carasso observed. This dissociation of desire from image, so John Martin Hull, is a very curious and unsettling thing. 
The blind man seems to disappear into the future as if, if he had already eaten or performed the sexual act. His hunger is relativized as is the spatial world of things and bodies, erotic attraction or desire. John Martin Hull lost his sight to cataracts. But sometimes going blind can trigger a fall not into the future, but into an almost frozen past. I'm reminded of a case study published by the neuropsychologist Oliver Sachs in his collection of seven paradoxical tales, the title of which recalls the popular examples in Wittgenstein's late writings, an anthropologist on Mars, which was a wonderful example by Wittgenstein himself from 1995. Most of the case, story, uh, case stories in this volume deal with paradoxes of seeing, or rather of seeing in not seeing. There is a colorblind painter, an autistic draftsman, a memory artist who constantly depicts his birthplace, a small Tuscan mountain town, from every conceivable perspective. There is the experience of a blind man whose eyesight was restored to him in surgery, or the experience of a young man who lost his memory in the 1960s. The story, you know it may be, is about the last hippie. It reads like a parody of all the hopes and errors of the generation to which I myself belong. Greg is a 68 -er, a dedicated Grateful Dead fan who, after the inevitable disappointment of political illusions, sought and found his way to a Hare Krishna temple. His spiritual career seemed to be succeeding the intensity of his meditation work increased until it became apparent that Craig was suffering from a brain tumor that had caused widespread amnesia. Craig literally lived in the moment, like a true Indian sannyasin who had freed himself from all ties to the world. Admittedly, he was not living in a current Unia Mystica, but in a past moment. No event after 1970 could reach him. In his consciousness, Vietnam was still being fought for. In his consciousness, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, or Ronald Pickpen, McCormon of the Grateful Dead remained alive. In this story of the last hippie are the following comments on Greg, Greg's blindness, quoting now Oliver Sacks. His eyes showed complete optic atrophy. It was impossible for him to see anything. But strangely, he did not seem to be aware of being blind and would guess that I was showing him a blue ball, a red pen, when in fact it was a green comb and a four watch that I showed him. Nor indeed did he seem to look. He made no special effort to turn in my direction. And, we were, and when we were speaking, he often failed to face me, to look at me. When I asked him about seeing, he acknowledged this, that his eyes weren't all that good, but added that he enjoyed watching the TV. Watching TV for him, I observed later, consisted of following with attention the soundtrack of a movie or show and inventing visual scenes to go with it, even though he might not even be looking toward the TV. He seemed to think indeed that this was what seeing meant, that this was what was meant by watching TV, and that this was what all of us did. Perhaps he had lost the very idea of seeing. I found this aspect of Greg's blindness, his singular blindness to his blindness, his no longer knowing what seeing or looking meant, deeply perplexing. It seemed to point to something stranger and more complex than a mere deficit, to point rather to some radical alteration within him in the word structure of knowledge and consciousness and identity itself." Unquote. The observations of Oliver Sacks seem to suggest that two ways of seeing have to be distinguished. A first order seeing, which is done at least partly with the help of one's eyes, and a second order seeing, which is performed with the help of one's consciousness, the little knowledge that I see and what this seeing implies. To say it inaccurately, on the one, one hand, we, we see with the eyes, on the other hand, with mind and brain consciousness. Seeing with brain makes possible, of course, only the seeing with the eyes. Who sees only with the eyes, rather than with his or her consciousness, sees basically nothing at all. A severely injured central nervous system cannot be made to see with the best lenses and optical systems. Optics alone do not produce images and the vision. 
Greg could communicate about television programs, but not about seeing itself. This uh, respective injury or disturbance of his second order side caused what sex calls blindness to blindness. A loss of that familiarity with one's own seeing, which Wittgenstein raised in the question, is it a familiar fact to me that I see? Or what could this familiar fact consist of? Sex considers it, it to be the expression of a recognition that is directed not only to the objects of perception, but also to the perceiver himself. That is why he reports of the last hippie crack that he was incapable to hold in mind an absence. When the leg caused pain, briefly he knew something had happened. He knew it was there as soon as the pain ceased, it went from his mind. Had he had visual hallucinations or phantoms, as the blind sometimes do, at least in the first months and years after losing their sight, he could have spoken of them, said, look, or wow. But in the absence of actual visual input, he could hold nothing in mind about seeing or not seeing or the loss of a visual world. In his person and in his world now, Craig knew only presence, no absence. He seemed incapable of registering any loss, loss of function in himself or of an object or a person. The loss of the sense of sight is exacerbated by the loss of this loss. The lost hippie seems to lack the very absence of eyes. Greg is described as having gone blind, not only externally, but also internally, as having lost second aura, seeing the view of himself as a sighted or non-sighted person. From Greg's story, it could be concluded that he was only capable to perceive what is present, but is no longer able to remember, namely to keep the absent inwardly present, literally to represent. He who can no longer remember is lost to himself. In the world of the permanently present, he is permanently absent on himself. To put it the other way around, only he who remains permanently present himself can form, as it were, that insight, that containment of consciousness in which the outside can also be preserved during his absence. Consciousness would thus be defined as a double relation, firstly as an inner relation of memory, reflection, self-relation, and secondly as an outer relation to persons or objects of the world. Consciousness would be the inside as second order seeing, which only makes possible an outside, a first order seeing, that inner eye which allows the perceptive view of an outer world. Greg lives in a permanent present, different to Hall or Borges living in the future. He can't see into the future like a modern Theresius, but sometimes he can see the past. When Oliver Sex invites his patient to join him at a Grateful Dead concert at Madison Square Garden, a Greg sees Jerry Garcia's Afro hairstyle in strong contrast to the latter's now gray hair that fell in a straight, unimpeded descent to his shoulders. And he sees the dead pigpen. Even after Sex enlightens him that pigpen had been dead for many years. The shocking note, however, can be quickly forgotten. Quoting, but then the thumping, pounding excitement of the crowd got him. The rhythmic clapping and stamping and chanting possessed him. And he started to chant the dead, the dead. And with a shift of rhythm and a slow emphasis on each word, we want the dead. He quite literally encountered the dead. And we recall once again the fifth hymn of Kalimachos in which Athena assures Theresia's wailing mother that her son will receive not only the gift of divination, but after an extraordinary long life, the ability to hear and understand the dead in the underworld. And now uh, proceeding to chapter three, Hands, colors, dreams, revelations. Seeing without eyes, seeing and not seeing. Of what seeing tell the blind themselves? What and when and how do they see? Although at the same time they do not see. Let us begin in the first part of the 19th century. On December 21, 1827, Laura Bridgman, a name like a metaphor, was born in Hanover, New Hampshire. 
At the age of two, she contracted scarlet feather and lost all her senses, hearing, sight, taste, and smell, except touch. Luck in disguise, at the age of seven, Laura enters the Perkins Institute for the Blind in Boston, where doctor and civil rights activist Samuel Gridley Howe takes great care of her. He teaches her a finger alphabet for the deaf with the help of which she can gradually communicate. A few years later on a trip to the USA, uh, Charles Dickens visits the Perkins Institute and meets Laura who is now 12 years old. Dickens tells the story, I quote, there she was before me, built up as it were in a marble cell, impervious to any ray of light or particle of sound, with her poor white hand peeping through a chink in the wall, beckoning to some good man for help. Her hair, braided by her own hands, was bound about a head whose intellectual capacity and development were beautifully expressed in its graceful outline and its broad, open brow. Her dress, arranged by herself, was a pattern of neatness and simplicity. The work she had knitted lay beside her. Her writing book was on the desk she leaned upon. Unquote. Dickens is fascinated by the doctor's reports and by the girl's finger skills, by the marvelous speed with which she writes her thoughts in the air of or reads other people's messages by taking their hands in her own and following each finger movement. It is in this way that she converses with her blind playmates and nothing can more forcibly show the power of mind enforcing matter to its purpose than a meeting between them. Laura dies in Boston on May 24, 1889, just one year after her death. The Austrian philosopher Wilhelm Jerusalem publishes her biography dedicated to Wilhelm Wundt, in which he quotes from Laura's sketch of her early life written down in 1854. I remember very clearly how my hand saw wider as my eye. Seeing with your hands. Laura Bridgman is now more than 50 years old. When Kate Adams, second wife of former officer Arthur Henley Keller, reads the chapter on Laura in Charles Dickens' American Notes. Her daughter, Helen, born on June 27, 1880, has also lost her hearing and sight at the age of 19 months after a severe meningitis. The blind, deaf, mute girl is also taken to the Perkins Institute where in March 1887, she meets her then 21-year-old teacher, Anne Sullivan, who already taught Laura Bridgman. Helen later becomes a successful writer at Hans Radcliffe College, learns several foreign languages, including German and French, and earns a Bachelor of Arts degree. She corresponded with Wilhelm Jerusalem, became involved as a socialist, and published several books that were translated into many languages. In 1904, The World I Live In was published. This volume began with a few essays on the seeing hand. Helen Keller writes, I quote, my hand is to me, what you're hearing inside together are to you. In large measure, we travel the same highways, read the same books, speak the same language, yet our experiences are different. All my comings and goings turn on the hand as on the pilot. It is the hand that binds me to the world of men and women. The hand is my feeler with which I reach through isolation and darkness and seize every pleasure, every activity that my fingers encounter. With the dropping of a little word from another's hand into mine, a slight flutter of the fingers began the intelligence, the joy, the fullness of my life. In all my experiences and thoughts, I am conscious of a hand. Whatever moves me, whatever thrills me, is as a hand that touches me in the dark, and the touch is my reality. Quote Ed, the hand see when the eyes fail. The story of Helen Keller, William Stern, the development psychologist and father of Gunther Anders, wrote an early biography. Thus revolves around the hands and Keller's relationships through touch with other people and living beings, such as the dogs, for example, with, with which she was often photographed. Mostly, however, blind people speak of hearing. John Martin Hall emphasizes one never possesses the sound, one never has it within one's power the way that one possesses the sight. 
the evil eye has power over the world, but nobody ever heard of an evil ear, of an evil ear. Well, then, these sentences do not apply to all blind people, of course. Jacques Le Siron, who lost his sight in an accident when he was eight years old, a child who always loved to draw and paint, tells again and again of the vivid colors of all things. Of an inner light, a mind's eye that illuminates his world. He likes to accompany his father to concerts, but afterwards he confesses. This is a very interesting quote, I think. Music was made for blind people, Jacques Le Siron writes, but some blind people are not made for music. I was among them. I was one of the visual blind. I did not become a musician and the reason was a strange one. I had no sooner made a sound on the A string on D or G or C than I no longer heard it. I looked at it. Tones, chords, melodies, rhythms, each was immediately transformed into pictures, curves, lines, shapes, landscapes, and most of all color. Whenever I made the A string sound by itself of the bow, such a burst of light appeared from before my eyes and lasted so long that often I had to stop playing. At concerts, for me, the orchestra was like a painter. It flooded me with all the colors of the rainbow. If the violin came in by itself, it, I was suddenly filled with gold and fire and with red so bright that I couldn't remember having seen it on any object. When it was the oboe's turn, a clear green ran all through me, so cool that I seemed to feel the breath of night. I visited the land of music. I rested my eyes on every one of its scenes. I left it till it caught my breath. But I saw music too much to be able to speak its language. My own language was the language of shapes. The perception of an inner light helps Le Siron to survive even the dark months in a prison cell and in the concentration camp of Buchenwald. The world is increasingly gray, quite literally a world of horrors, Greuel in German. But yet Le Siron writes, on myself, I can't say why I was never entirely bereft of joy, but it was a fact and my solid support. Joy I found even in strange byways in the midst of fear itself, when fear departed from me as infection leaves an abscess when it bursts. Among the most remarkable experiences of blindness, which even the quite diverse accounts of Alan Keller, Jacques Lucieron, or Joe Martin Hall, or Jose Luke Borges combine, is the ability to dream. In their dreams, not only do they all resort to sentences, thoughts, sounds, or sensations of touch, they also dream in images. In almost every recording of his notes on blindness, Hall narrates a dream, and his dreams, even beyond the visual, remain vivid and, and somehow pictorial. Hall notes, let us distinguish between the way that blindness affects the process of dreaming and the way it affects the contents of the dream. In referring to the process, how does one dream about people for whom there is no visual image? Does one continue to dream in color? How does one dream of places when there are no pictures to give form to those places? By the content, I mean the way in which the actual story of the dream recognizes blindness, whether in the dream I encounter the problems of blindness or know myself as being blind or do things only a blind person would do, like placing my hand on someone's head to tell his or her height. Elsewhere, he recounts a nightmare about the death of his daughter Lizzie and he states, this dream was very visual, the colors were brilliant, people's clothes the green of the grass and the bright colors of the flowers, there was no trace of blindness. And on August 21st, 1984, he notes, last night I had a vivid dream in color. I dreamed that I had got out of bed and was kneeling or sitting beside the bed, perhaps looking for my slippers or something. This little toddler came padding into the room. I could see her. He never saw her. Or, uh, you know, in reality, I could see her quite clearly in the dim light. In the dream, I knew that I had been blind and this, that this was the first time I had been able to see her. I started her full of wonder, taking in every detail of her face as she stood there, wreathed in smiles, stretching out her hands to me. It was like a revelation. I thought, so this is her, this is the smile they all talk about. 
These are those luminous brown eyes. I had a wonderful sense of a renewal of contact as I felt that she was amazed as she realized in some way that there was something different about me, that I was responding to her in a new sort of way. We stood there in complete silence, or at least I sat there and she stood beside me. We gazed at one another in this moment of mutual delight, then the dream faded. In her description of the world I live in, Helen Keller also tried to depict her dream world. She emphasizes that in my dreams I have sensations, odors, tastes, and ideas which I do not remember to have had in reality, but she also mentions visual impressions. Sometimes, she writes, a wonderful light visits me in sleep, such a flash and glory as it is, I gaze and gaze until it vanishes. In her dreams, she feels free and independent. A smell, and taste much as in my waking hours, but the sense of touch plays a less important part. In sleep, I almost never grope. No one guides me. Even in a crowded street, I'm self-sufficient and I enjoy an independence quite foreign to my physical life. Now I seldom spell on my fingers and it is still rarer for others to spell into my hand. My mind acts independent of my physical organs. I am delighted to be thus endowed, if only in sleep, for then my soul dance its winged sandals and joyfully joins the throng of happy beings who dwell beyond the reaches of bodily sense, called them. The line between waking and dreaming seems blurred to her, especially in her memories of earliest childhood. The likeness, she writes, between my waking state and the sleeping one is still marked. In both states I see, but not with my eyes. I hear, but not with my ears. I speak and I'm spoken to without the sound of a voice. I'm moved to pleasure by visions of ineffable beauty, which I have never beheld in the physical world. Once in a dream, I held in my hand a pearl. The one I saw in my dreams must therefore have been a creation of my imagination. It was a smooth, exquisitely molded crystal. As I gazed into its shimmering depths, my soul was flooded with an ecstasy of tenderness, and I was filled with wonder as one who should for the first time look into the cool, sweet heart of rose. My pearl was dew and fire, the velvety green of moss, the soft whiteness of lilies, and the still juice and sweetness of a thousand roses. It seemed to me the soul of beauty was dissolved in its crystal bosom. Helen Keller. Jacques Lucerin and John Martin Hall are dreaming, at least occasionally, in colors and in images. What unites them beyond that is a deep faith, a kind of certainty of the transcendent. Keller was a follower of the teachings of Immanuel Swedenborg, so insightfully described, you know, by Olaf Lagerkrantz, and even Borges was fascinated by Swedenborg's mystical writings. Keller's uh, spirituality sprang from an evidence of emptiness, a measureless void that she never forgot. In her life, an experience manifested itself that Alfred North White had characterized in his lectures on the origin of religion in 1926 at Harvard University with the following sentences. I like them very much. Religion is what the individual does with his own solitary. It runs through three stages if it evolves to its final satisfaction. It is the transition from God the void to God the enemy and from God the enemy to God the companion. Quotent. Jacques Lucerin repeatedly tells of his inner light and an invisible companion. I knew very early, Lucerin writes, I'm quite sure of him that another being concerned himself with me and even addressed himself to me. This other I didn't even call God. I had no known for him. He was just there. And also John Martin Hull speaks in a lot of his records about the experience of a companion beyond the difference between light and darkness. This being is Lord of all worlds. The world of heaven, of light, is God. The world of shell, of darkness, and of the depths is also God. It makes no difference to God where I am or in what world I find myself. God is not enclosed within the world of heavenly light, nor is God defeated by the world of impenetrable night. Now I imagine I'm flying. 
I imagine I'm free once again to go where I will and that the morning and the ocean will once again be accessible to me. John Martin Hull transforms the elemental opposites between being and nothingness, light and darkness, life and death, consciousness and the unconscious into an experience that makes him understand even blindness as a gift. He writes, if blindness is a gift, then death is a gift. What shall we give in return for our death? Whatever we are able to give, it must be in anticipation. For when we receive that final gift, we will have nothing left to give. But if blindness is a gift and death is a gift, what have we to fear? If life is death, then death is life. If darkness is light, then light is darkness. The conscious and the unconscious lives are one. We have nothing, yet we have everything. The world, life or death or the present or the future are all ours and we are gods. Go there. It would be all too easy to criticize or dismiss the pathos of such sentences. For the tale of a creative, non-destructive experience of emptiness, void and nothingness. Mystics in various religions talk of such experiences. Artists talk of such experiences. And perhaps it's no coincidence that it is precisely those fields, mysticism and the arts, which are struggling today to give a new expression to the phenomenon of seeing without eyes, faith of the faithless, according to Simon Critchley, living in a light beyond the vision. Michel de Certeau calls it an astonishment that is not accompanied by representation. The experience of the look is a surprise without object. The look of the other excludes the possession of an image. It deprives of sight. It bedazzles. It blinds. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, Professor Marco, many, many thanks for this very rich and I dare say very ecastic, vivid uh, presentation, also for the care you put into providing us with a, with a um, transdisciplinary and uh, transcultural material to, to reflect upon. And there is very, very much to say. I, I'd like to, to remind that uh, many of you already know this, the um, previous session of this seminar was a presentation by Jacopo Bodini focused on the um, acoustic dimension, on the experience of sound. So I'm very happy to, to see how the seminar is going, with, is going precisely in the dimension uh, I and Antonio were imagining while, while designing this, this cycle. Thank you very much for your presentation. Again, I believe there is much to discuss. So uh, it would go like this. Um, for those who are with us on Zoom, you can raise your hand as Morgan already um, told you on, in chat, or if you are shy, maybe <laughs> you uh, can uh, ask your question by writing it in the chat and we are going to, to read it. For those of you who are on YouTube, you can unfortunately not take part acoustically, but uh, you can write your question in the chat and Morgan will communicate it to us. So I'd like to open the discussion and uh, mm, uh, yeah, we are ready for, for your interventions. Mm -hmm.